Great. So, sorry about the slight delay on that, so I'll pass it over to Uri. Thank you. Uh, sorry for the delay as well, I'll try to be quick. So, I, uh, I think the, the organizers put us one after another because they thought we were going to say different things, but I'm not sure I got everything Paul was about to say or something from what Paul was saying, but uh, I think we say more or less the same thing in the end. It's just the title <laughs> is different, and especially my running example is very similar to the, to the example that uh, Paul showed first. We're just going, going to look at it in a bit more depth. Um, okay. So it requires some background, uh, you, uh, some context. Uh, let me see. Page down. Yeah. So I think there is a recent proposal for C and C++ standard, a fix for the thin air problem that, if I understand correctly, is more or less this is the idea. So we will have a new model that will have three steps. In uh, maybe I'm wrong, but think about this just a possible idea. So step one, we're going just like now, calculate all the candidate execution graphs. So ignore consistency completely, look at all possible execution graphs that one can generate for a program. And then, given this big set, de derive a semantic dependency relation, this SDEP that we talked about for each of these graphs. So we have a global view of all execution graphs and we now we, we derive this SDEP relation. And then we apply the consistency predicate from uh, C or C++ and we can change it or whatever you like about consistency. So this is the, the idea. Uh, I, I keep this step two and step three parametric. I'm not saying how we are going to do this, but let's imagine it's going to work. Um, so this is the consistency predicate of RC11 for those of you who knows, the bunch of derived relations. It's not so important, but what we get on top of RC11 is that we are able to replace um, this axiom there's no thin air axiom, very conservative axiom, no, no cycles in program order and reads form by a much less conservative axiom, no cycles in semantic dependency, union and reads form. So why do we want this? Because it will allow us to have a more efficient implementation and we will be able to reorder relaxed accesses that we, something we cannot do in RC11. Either the, yes, Paul? Uh, why RF instead of RFE? RFE, same, yes. I should have said SDEP is a, is a part of uh, um, program order, is a subset of program order. Maybe it can be RFE, even better, I'm not sure. Um, so we'll be able to reorder these two uh, relaxed uh, read followed by relaxed write, which we cannot do in RC11 as long as they are independent. The compiler can do this, the hardware can do this, the hardware doesn't think it's a primitive access, so we can actually use ARM with uh, primitive accesses for relaxed uh, um, accesses of C. And one of the nice things here, and the nicest, I think, is that we have this problem in the C standard for a long time, and we can now not change too much. We are not going to dramatically change the model, like go to the promising semantics or event structures or things like that. We just add this step two in the middle and somehow uh, change one axiom, and things will work. So you can see from my tone, I guess, that I, I think this cannot work. And I'll argue uh, with an example that uh, first, the step two thing cannot be thread local which is already quite counterintuitive. You have to look in the code of other threads to see if you have a semantic dependency or not. And Paul was showing similar examples before. Um, and the second one is that step two, I think, actually has to be aware of the consistency predicate of step three. So we cannot separately separate the concerns nicely like this. We have to be aware of consistency when we check for semantic dependencies, uh, which is maybe something Paul already said. I'm not completely sure. So, yeah. So just a, a bit of a background how this can work. So this is a small program. Uh, we have two threads. The th uh, left thread is reading X. If it read one, it writes uh, uh, one to Y. Then it prints foo. And uh, if it doesn't read one for X, it writes one to Y as well. And the other thread reads Y and writes the value it read to X. And we ask, can foo be printed? And we want to analyze with this model that I said before. First, we observe that with sim very simple compiler optimizations that are there, it has to be allowed to print foo in this program. The compiler can change this A to 1, this is just a trace preserving transformation, and then take this Y1 that appear in both branches to move before the local read of this local variable A, and then the hardware can reorder these accesses. So let's say these are relaxed accesses, the hardware can reorder them. And then if Y1 happens first, and then the second thread runs, uh, it will write this one to X, and then I can read X, and then uh, foo is being printed. So we want to allow this, and how this SDEP idea will work. 
uh, we generate all the candidate execution graphs. I, I'm choosing like, uh, uh, just suppose you have only zero and one as values. So we have only four execution graphs. I ignore this foo also in the execution graphs up there. So left thread has uh, uh, two options and right thread has two options. Um, and now we analyze these for dependencies. So I'm not, I'm not being uh, specific, but it's clear that on the right side, we do have dependency because the, val the value that we read from y is exactly the value that we write to x. While on the left side, we don't have dependency. We can see from the graphs because no matter what I read from uh, x, I will write one to y. So with this sort of analysis, you can imagine some way to define it. We can conclude that there is a semantic dependency on the, on the right thread, but not on, on the on the second thread, but not on the first thread. Yes? So I'm not sure if to take questions now or later, but go. I, I have another question. This is a statement of confusion. I have no idea. It sounds as if you're saying that the right thread is an Okay, let's chat, chat about this later. Maybe I'll get your point, but the analysis is important is looking at all execution graphs. We all, we all understand by now that by just looking on one of them, I don't have enough information, but I look on all execution graphs of the program and then I do the analysis. Suppose there is some way to do this. And I'm saying as if it's not, no one calculates this. It's just a part of definition. It's not, doesn't have to be computable or anything. It's just a way to define semantics. Maybe it can work. Um, so here it works because uh, indeed when we focus on this uh, uh, last execution graph here, we see uh, we can add these reads from edges and then we actually check consistency and we can see it is consistent, there is no cycle. And this last execution graph, this one depicted here, is actually the one that is printing foo on, because you read one from x and so we say yes, foo can be printed. So this is how the, such a model can work. Now, the slight variation of this shows the problem, and it's very similar to the first example in, in Paul's talk. Um, we, instead of, uh, in the second, uh, in the else branch, instead of just writing one to y, we, f we read some other variable z, and we write this value that we read into y. So b is z, and then uh, y is b. And a third thread is writing that z has to be one. So we try to do a similar analysis. We have three execution graphs for the left side, two execution graphs for the, uh, the, like before, for the middle side, and one possible execution graph for the right side. And we want to somehow, it's completely clear that we have semantic dependency in the middle thread, right? Uh, because we read the value that we are going to write the value that we just read. But the big question is whether we have a semantic dependency on, on that, uh, on that uh, case. If there is some analysis that we look on these execution graphs and we say, yes, there is semantic dependency or no, there is no semantic dependency. And this will lead us either to the first case above that there is no semantic dependency and then there is no violation of any axiom and foo can be printed or to the second case where there is a semantic dependency and then there is a cycle in SDEP and, and external rates form and then foo cannot be printed. So this is the important question, whether we have here a semantic dependency or not, and do we have enough information? Now, we have the full program, nothing else is happening to, to, to decide on that. So first I claim there must, be a, there must not be a semantic dependency <coughs> because by uh, uh, compiler optimizations that now it's a matter of assumptions, but I think we want to allow these compiler optimizations. Um, we want to allow the compiler to introduce redundant loads Give me a second about that later. Uh, I'll say more about this later. And we also want to allow the compiler to forward loads across atomics. So we, in this case that we read Z and then we read X and X is atomic and let's say Z is non-atomic and then we read Z again, we want to be able to forward this, uh, the, first, uh, the result of the first read to the second, to the second read. And also the, um, okay. So both of these optimizations are done by uh, LLVM. Uh, yes, if it's a question about load introduction, then wait a bit. These are all relaxed atomics. These are all relaxed okay. atomics, but I hear I'm saying that Z can easily be done non-atomic. Uh, but think for now that they are all relaxed atomic. I can easily change the pro problem that Z is non-atomic and I put some synchronization. This Z thing is simple, so I don't have races on Z. But about load introduction, wait a bit more for uh, the end of this uh, talk. So both of these transformations are actually performed. You can check it in some cases. Either both LLVM and GCC will do these optimizations. If we don't like them, we need to ch fix the compilers. Um, 
And how does this look? Uh, roughly, it's not the whole picture, but you can introduce this load of Z. I'm, I'm manipulating thread one. Introduce a load of Z, and then there is this if, else, and, but I do the same thing that I do I, in the if and the else branch. So this dot, dot, dot in else branch is exactly what I do in the if branch, which is exactly like the original thread. And then uh, the second thing is this forwarding. I forward the read of Z to the second read of Z, and I go over this read of X in the middle. So it's exactly the forwarding that we need. And then the, th the third step is, uh, again, trace-preserving transformation, where you just uh, uh, change this C to 1. Uh, I think I'll take questions in the end, if that's OK. I'm not sure if, uh, if, if because I see some people are wondering. But, maybe, but it's OK that we disagree. I hope this talk will be, some, this workshop will be a base, uh, some place where we can kind of make sure we have the same assumptions on this problem. Otherwise, we are not solving the, the same problem. So if, when I reach this one, um, now it's very similar to the example I had before. Why is one can go out, and then it can, uh, out of, I mean, if and else, you both have y is 1, and then it can go before the if, uh, before the x, and then we can get this full behavior. So with this analysis of compiler optimizations, we have to allow this behavior. We have to show, to say that there is no s-step there. But the problem is, if we change now thread number 3 to z is 0, now, with this one, foo has, cannot be printed because printing foo means that you read one, but one is ne nowhere in the program. In the program, this is a clear case of thin air, out of thin air uh, value that you can read. So if z is zero in the third thread, then you should not be able to uh, print foo. So uh, this must, we, in this case, we must have a semantic dependency. So the conclusion, uh, the first conclusion, I, th I think, is that the SDEP calculation, this in, uh, idea, the uh, ideal calculation that we didn't define, we already understand, if we ex accept my assumption so far, that can, it cannot be thread local. You have to look at what happens in other thread in order to know if I have a semantic dependency or not. And I think the situation is even worse. Now you can change this Z to be any of your litmus tests, whatever you want, and I think um, if this litmus test returns always zero, then we don't, that would be, I would count, count this as thin air behavior to show that print, uh, that uh, this foo is printed. This is my favorite litmus test. <laughs> I don't know if you, uh, so it's just showing some complicated uh, uh, cor uh, correlation between, um, uh, it's not important, release acquire and atomicity. So there is some reasoning here. You, you, you need to really understand deeply the C11 axioms. I'm a bit uh, exaggerating, but uh, never mind. Uh, to see that this always returns zero. And if it's always returns zero, then uh, indeed, we, if we, and we want to forbid this behavior, then the step two calculation of semantic dependency has to understand the consistency predicate and know about consistency to see that it always returns zero and then say, yes, there is a semantic dependency in this case. What I assume here is something that I, I find very natural. It's very, it's very uh, dangerous to show sanity conditions for weak memory models because most of many of intuitions we have are just wrong uh, late, at later point. But this thing I haven't seen, maybe you know it from some other places, but I, I believe is essential for uh, reasoning. I call it substitution of equivalence. If f always returns zero in some memory model m, then f should be equivalent to zero, to the, should be able to replace f by zero and vice versa uh, in the memory model m. And here I assume that this f doesn't touch, suppose it runs on a completely different thread, it doesn't touch any of my variables, it's completely orthogonal, completely disjoint to my program. I think if this doesn't work, we will not be able to reason about our program. So if you think this is too strong, I'm happy to understand why. Uh, but I think memory models we design will have to uh, admit this property. And this is what, I, in my analysis before, this is what I assume. Um, a few more words about this. We can assume like two different memory models. Uh, one for reasoning, like thinner for me. No, uh, the outer thinner is like... Uh, a very basic program logic, invariant-based logic that you can apply on your programs. But you can have maybe later a more complicated program logic that you want to be sound. And then it may show that SDEP must exist in some cases. So essentially what will happen is that we have a memory model for reasoning that we use to calculate SDEP and another memory model for the actual behaviors. And you can have a gap between them. But if you ever want to have reasoning to be potentially precise, so I can always improve my program logic to be complete, in a sense, then SDEP has to know precisely all the details of the consistency predicate um, in order to calculate SDEP. 
So what is the source of the pro problem, and this is already uh, there in, in Paul's talk, is, I think, is in my words, is that semantic dependency are dynamic. They are not a static thing. You cannot start by calculating them. You need to, on the way, see. In our case, SDEP, you should, we should have it uh, if and only if the model allows a thread to read a, a particular thread, our case is thread one, to read a particular value, this Z is one, at a certain program point. And this is not so something that we can only know when we actually run uh, or we apply the full consistency predicate uh, from beginning. Event structure models and POMSENT models and the promising semantics that I'm involved in capture these then dynamic dependencies um, while this idea that we started with cannot do this. So this is the rule from promising semantics. It's, the details are not important, but it can pro only promise if it, ca it can certify from the current state. I should be sure that I can fulfill my promise from the current state. So I have my current state when I'm saying that something depends or doesn't depend on something else. Uh, it's not that I do it a priori without uh, uh, knowing what will be the state of the memory and what I can read and what I cannot read at some point. Um, so this is the last slide. It's a short, I think, relatively short talk. Uh, what, it's related to our PLDI 23 paper that you are invited to uh, look at and discuss with us. Um, so it's my view on the thin air. So a lot of the discussion also here today um, the, about the outer thin air problem revolves about, uh, around this memory order relaxed from C11 as if this is the worst thing ever. And there were already some questions raised here this morning. Uh, is it indeed important at all to forbid read-write reordering of relaxed accesses? More provocatively, do we actually even need relaxed writes? So let's just not use relaxed writes in our programs. Uh, so it's all focused on this relaxed thing. But I think, and this is related to this load introduction, the load introduction thing doesn't work in C11. You cannot introduce a load of an anatomic because it, will create, it may create races. But load introduction is something compilers are doing. And you, you will get a similar, I think even more practical, I would say, but I'm not coming from the practical world too much, um, problem if you try to just support two things, strong accesses, let's say SC or mutexes, whatever you prefer, that you can race on, and the second is weak accesses, these non-atomics that allow all the optimizations that you can do in sequential code, especially in load introduction and read-write reordering. So just try to develop a memory model for these two th simple things. You don't need to understand all the C11 uh, stuff, and you will soon get stuck, and you'll get stuck. You need ideas like promising semantics, event structure, things that you, you think are, are much more difficult than what this small problem looks like. So my understanding is that the, the difficult problem for C11 is actually load, load introduction rather than uh, re this reordering of relaxed accesses. And somehow our focus on relaxed accesses obscure this, uh, this uh, deeper problem that I, I think there is in this uh, C11 or RC11 memory model. And that's it. Now I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you. Could you please go back to the slide where you showed the original litmus test where you wanted to introduce a load? Um, okay, so if I understand correctly, on thread one on, on the left-hand pane, we have Z being a relaxed load only in the else clause. And then if, as we go over there, we introduce a load before the if statement. If I, oh, it's, it's a relaxed load everywhere. I right, understood. Uh, but in, so we've got B equals Z uh, in the else clause only. So on the, yes. on the, on the left-hand pane, the then clause does not load Z at all and the else clause does. Right. And then we go to thread one and Z is loaded unconditionally. In Correct? the first, first part? You, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Yes. So um, as somebody that writes programs, I would find that extremely inconvenient because it might, in some cases, because it could be the then clause is called really, really often and the else clause rarely. And it could be that loading Z almost always miss, gets me a cache miss, in which case I'm going to be very, very annoyed at you if you hoist that load out of that if statement. So you're trying to, to use compilers. I'm trying to prove compilers. So I don't care about the performance. It's something that well, we want to allow. I care about the performance. I don't know for sure. It's something <laughs> so, that we want to allow. So I want to see what model can allow this thing. Maybe in other cases, it will be also uh, useful for performance. I guess uh, LLVM and GCC, I guess, I don't know. They know what they do in some cases. And they do it to improve performance, not just because they want. So they will not do exactly this thing. But very similar things, they will introduce a load in the program. For non-atomics right now. 
Yeah, of, of course. For non-atomics, yes. So I can easily in, make... If I'm hoisting out of a loop... I can easily make Z non-atomic in this example if I just put some really sacroa synchronization. So I just right. try if to make, If you make it non-atomic, I'm not worried because yeah. then I'm not probably not getting the cache mess, or if I do get the cache mess, I probably messed up. But uh, to Ralph's point, though, he, he mentioned that uh, hoisting out of loops is important. But if I'm hoisting out of a loop, I have a situation where I would have loaded it as long, unless I went through the loop zero times. So, but that's exactly the point. That's loaded okay. production, yes. Um, and you do that right now for... Yeah. Okay, so you do that for atomics right now? I somehow, I really like the trick that of C11, no undefined behavior for races. I think it's, it's simplified our life a lot, but somehow uh, the fact that I cannot just read something. Uh, I want to debug, I want to do something, I don't care about anything. I just want to read Z and somehow I gain behaviors by reading something. It's mm -hmm. very unnatural to me. So I think when you try to do uh, the modular reasoning or the notational reasoning or whatever, you'll get stuck if you read, it, read introduction is not allowed. You cannot just observe, it's like you can, you, in a sense, in this model. So um, I, this is why I'm saying I think Z should be non-atomic because they're, they're really... Uh, if you make it non-atomic, I got no, no problem. Yeah, but then, but then I agree that, I, I again say that the problem is that um, in, uh, load introduction is unsound for non-atomics, even though compilers are doing this and we are all ignoring this fact for some reason, I think, and maybe not all, but... Okay, um, how quick is your question? We're kind of running short on time, that's all. Uh, with with non-atomics uh, plus load introduction, my, my, uh, so the final slide I was trying to say it's a difficult challenge. Uh, sorry, and it's difficult because simple axiomatic models don't work. You need to look event structures. You need to go promising semantics. Um, I, I guess, do, you, do you have to throw away the, the, the axiomatic portion of the C++ standard to solve this effort? No, you need to play with it differently. You need somehow to, you can use it in some other uh, context, of course, very useful, the consistency predicate, but it's not just take all executions filter and that's what you get. You need to do something uh, smarter, more difficult. Okay, um, actually, the next, session, the next talk is 